Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent, thanks. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a complicated uh, story about complex emotions. Um, so to give you some idea of where I'm going in my brief presentation, uh, it's three parts. I'm going to talk about the beginnings of nationalism in the 19th century, the challenge to nationalism and the beginnings of a European transnational idea in the 20th, and how those two are coming uh, to confront each other in the present century. And so we're going back to the century of nationalism, which transformed the map of Europe because it posited, first of all, the notion of popular sovereignty. And then uh, the people who were supposedly sovereign were redefined as a cultural community and called a nation. And each of these nations claimed national self-determination in their own nation state. And the idea became that the state embodies a national identity. This completely overhauled the map of Europe, which consisted in the east of multi-ethnic empires and in the central belt of dynastic principalities. And all of these were reshuffled in the long 19th century towards the modular jigsaw puzzle map of Europe that we still are familiar with nowadays. Um, and where the Germans live in Germany, the French live in French and the Italians live in Italy. And it all looks very simple. Now you could um, tell this story from the point of view of political power, states, kings, presidents, armies. But if you redefine the people as a cultural community, I feel that uh, an important part was played by cultural actors um, and intellectuals, writers and artists who uh, inspired their communities to claim those political rights. And to look at the agency of culture uh, poses enormous methodological challenges. What is culture? You need to capture, uh, you know, in order to get to the cultural mobilization of national consciousness, large, very diffuse data and try and pinpoint these in space and time. That's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And uh, I've been using um, a, uh, uh, a method which I'll call empirical cultural history. And we've been looking at exchanges of ideas and communicative networks from Sir Walter Scott to the Brothers Grimm and how these networks enmeshed all of Europe. Also, the intellectuals, writers and artists um, who helped spread the notion of the nation were not stay-at-homes. They themselves were mobile across the map uh, of Europe from Madame de Staal to Wagner, uh, their travels crisscross all of the continent. This explains to some extent why all of Europe could get the message. It was partly through people like Liszt who spread the notion of his Hungarian nationality, but also the Hungarian rhapsodies and the love of that type of music, which could really enchant and enrapture the audience by taking a show on the road and going all around Europe. However, it was not just a pan-European affair. The distribution of those communications also tended to divide Europe. For instance, Mirimet in Paris had a network and his contemporary Arndt in Bonn had his network. And what you can see is that those two networks stand back to back. There is no such thing as an axis between Bonn and Paris. And the dead zone of non-communication between them uncannily foreshadows the Western Front in the First World War. And likewise, the enrapturing power of music was not just a pan-European thing in the concert halls of the capitals. It was also sung to national communities for national purposes, like the people who were enraptured by Rougie de Lille, when he first sang the Marseillaise. And you see that the soldiers who were inspired by the Marseillaise were uh, uh, you know, mobilized specifically for their nation. This repertoire proliferated around Europe as well. The 19th century is the century of national anthems, but each nation had their own, the Poles, the Brits, the Germans. And so all of Europe catches the romantic vogue of celebrating their own nation, more or less in the same way, but also about their own nation from the Scottish Highlands to Greece, to the Tyrolean Alps. And here, these two Norwegian warriors who you know, saved the little prince and invented the national sport of skiing in one and the same moment. They were all uh, patriotic heroes who were worshiped throughout the century. And not only in paintings, but also their memory was kept alive on the public squares of the cities of Europe, where they embodied the shared memories and the shared stories that the nations told to themselves. And if it wasn't about the past or about history, it was about the timeless traditions that were kept alive by the authenticity 
of customs and folk communities in the countryside. So this is romantic nationalism, the self-celebration in terms of pathos and sentiment. All this ran into a century that was very, very unromantic with the trench warfare of the First World War, the genocides of the Second World War, and the totalitarian technocratic dictatorships, romanticism was well and truly dead. And when Europe rebooted itself after 1945, the spirit was not about the past and about sentiment, but it was about technology and the future and about international cooperation. So the nation was challenged in the 20th century. If we see how historical monuments were put up in the cities of Europe, we see a very steep rise from the year 1800 onwards, but there's equally a very steep fall into the 1920s and then once again into the 1950s. A little bit of a rise again now, but I won't go into that here. Um, the monumentalism of the 19th century was, uh, you know, uh, refunctionalized. The great heroic monuments to the victors of the past, the Arc de Triomphe or the Vittorio Emanuele monument in Rome, were given a new purpose. They became sites of mourning. And in the middle, the victims of the wars were buried. The unknown soldier in the Arc de Triomphe and here in Rome, the grave of the unknown soldier. That happened shortly after 1918. So the 20th century holds out a less comforting, less pleasing view of the past. It is post-monumental, it's no longer heroic, it's often traumatic. And the memory of Europe is often shot through with remorse. Remorse about the guilts and the traumas and the tragedies of the colonial and totalitarian periods. It's not as comforting a view of the past as the 19th century had. And we have to ask ourselves, was this not a very difficult way for Europe to compete with the legacy of 19th century nationalism? The eye candy of Marianne on the Place de la République in Paris, maybe is a little more glamorous than these aluminium stars in some sort of a roundabout, a traffic calming in a, a dreary suburb of Maastricht commemorating the Treaty of 1992. And indeed, we have to ask ourselves, did not nationalism survive the challenge? It's not as if new statues were being put up all the time, but the old statues remained. Joan of Arc is still in all the French cities where she was put up in the 19th century. And in all the cities of Italy, Garibaldi, put up in the 19th and early 20th century, is still defining the cityscapes. The heroes are celebrated also on new media, media that have a far greater circulation than a statue or a painting. The banknotes in the pockets of people throughout, before the euro, um, or even the postage stamps that they put on their letters, were continuing the hero worship of the 19th century. And the great monuments of the 19th century became tourist destinations and the tourist destinations starting to sell the memories of the national past as souvenirs. We might scoff and call this trickle-down culture, debased culture, banal as Michael Billick calls it, but I think that this catching on to new media is what defines the 20th century. So the transition from statues to postage stamps or from huge big buildings to tourist souvenirs is something that keeps culture alive. Few people nowadays read Walter Scott's novel, Ivanhoe, but everybody is familiar with it, with the, with the story because of the movie, the television series, the comic strip, the youth, uh, the juvenile uh, versions and the uh, costume dramas put on, on the BBC. This remediation, I think, is very important to understand how the nation survived the uh, 20th century and is now being recycled for current use. And this brings me to my closing part. You will remember this Norwegian painting of 1869. Well, it was remediated into a movie and you see that the DVD cover of the movie and the posters, the, the poster of it actually verbatim quotes the style and the imagery of the uh, 19th century myth. The repertoire is being recycled in new media and in particular in film, television, the new technological media, we see a strong survival of National, uh, romantic nationalism. Whether this started with Rambo in 1982 or with Braveheart in 1995, I don't know. Very few, very often you mightn't even notice these movies. They don't show up in the Oscar celebrations. They're aimed at the 
you know, the mass market lower end, I call them popcorn epic, they're just for entertainment. It's definitely a global trend that goes all the way from Hollywood to Bollywood with a strong showing for Russia, Turkey and Central Asia in the middle. So all the new nations catch on uh, with this new medium and usually the mode is epic. It's about grim fighters in violent settings. Think Game of Thrones, that sort of stuff. And this is how you look, all stormy skies and battle scenes and people looking at you as if they're about to bite your throat through. Um, epic is not like a novel. It doesn't do subtlety. It's about heroic resistance against great danger. But in the new form, the great danger is always a threat from outside, foreigners threatening the homeland, a, a crisis, and the hero is a national hero, a national rescuer. Here in Europe, the repertoire tends to be a little bit more idyllic. We have nice feel-good movies celebrating the nation as a sort of an endurance of family values. But at the same time, we do have the epic mode. Uh, Mel Gibson uh, fighting the English, a Polish movie about uh, Jan Potowski fighting the Turks, a Turkish television series about Abdul Hamid fighting the Europeans, and a Frisian movie about the Frisians fighting Charlemagne and the rest of Europe. Us is always the nation, them is the rest of the world. And that brings me to my conclusion and my talking point for today. Nationalism has survived the 20th century in camouflage. I wouldn't call it banal nationalism, but feel good nationalism. It's a remediated souvenir version of what went on in the 19th century. It's diffused to channels that are not overtly political, leisure time entertainment, consumer culture, but they are an ongoing reinforcement of anti-cosmopolitanism and unconscious chauvinism. So the challenge for me is still what it was 10 years ago, except instead of looking at national consciousness, I think I have to look at a national subconsciousness and I have to map large data sets, sets of diffuse and banal data. That's my presentation for now. I'll stop sharing. I think you're muted, Laura. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Professor Lewis. That was that was really a great start. Thank you. Um, I want to begin by asking what you think these kind of modern manifestations um, of nationalism that we're seeing in these TV shows potentially without even realizing it. Um, I think very few people who sort of sit down to watch Game of Thrones consider themselves to be indulging in a sort of nationalist um, tendency. What kind of a need do you think is being fulfilled by these um, by these films and by this media? And is it the same as the kind of need that was being fulfilled um, in the images you showed us of people going crazy over the Marseilles, for example? Yeah, yeah. Um, very interesting question. I think, you know, while the repertoire shows great similarities and indeed continuities, it does do slightly different things. In the 19th century, this was uh, finding a fresh form of inspiration in stories that hadn't been told and that were retrieved from the past and that were somehow exciting. By now, these stories are familiar. And what they are used for is a sort of comfort viewing that takes us out of the challenging, alienating zone of difficult modern art uh, and, 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 you know, fraught, uh, complex stories and go, go back to something that is, you know, uh, feel good uh, and, and that is a comfort zone and, you know, it's leisure time. So you, you relax from the complexities of modern life and you do something that's simple and you do so with a little ironic smile. Uh, you don't take it seriously and it's a form of relaxation. So it, it's really become more anodyne in what the, the function that it fulfills but uh, and the political messages is taken on board almost as, as, as a sort of a hidden cargo. That sort of implies that it's absolutely harmless fun. And do you do you think that it is, or is there a sort of mm -hmm. slightly more? Well, um, I I wouldn't want to overbalance in the opposite direction and say that it's all a conspiracy. In many cases, people just do whatever is commercially promising. Uh, there's now a you know a television series on Netflix about Arminius the Bar the, the German uh, barbaren, which is f feeding into a very strong national. Uh, um, narrative in Germany, but basically the guy is just doing more blood and guts, you know, uh, heavy violence by unshaven heroes. 
and uh, following the Game of Thrones mode, I don't, don't think there's a sinister agenda here. But by falling back on the familiar patterns of stories that you've heard about or statues that you've seen somewhere, uh, it is, uh, you know, reinforcing the familiarity of these national narratives. There is also, I think, uh, in some quarters, a definite uh, commitment to a new nationalism. So the people who made that Frisian film Red Bad are, are definitely on the national end of the scale, as well as canny commercial film producers. Uh, and certainly in Turkey and in Russia and in a number of Central Asian republics, there is a, a, a real propaganda uh, um, agenda behind this. So it's, it's a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. And what do you think the effect of that um, actually is in, in the way we think about the, the world and specifically how we think about Europe? Well, it's not the sort of propaganda that we used to have in Stalinist Russia or, you know, during the dictatorships. It is not trying to inculcate on the audience, this is what you have to believe. Uh, what it's doing rather uh, is, is, is rather more, uh, you know, uh, presenting uh, a national continuity, a national story as being obvious, unchallenging, natural, the default way of how things are. So it is, if you like, encouraging laziness <laughs> in our worldview rather than trying to program us. Mm -hmm. I, I, to me, that sort of makes me think of your, the two images you showed, one of Marianne and one of the rather dull uh, European Union sculpture. Um, it's so much, it's so easy to sort of be reflexively inspired by um, a very dramatic statue like that. Um, what can Europe do to build its own legends of this kind? What, what can, how, how, can, how can a European project counteract national narratives or, or live alongside national narratives more comfortably? Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to become the sort of the cultural programmer for a European <laughs> sort of propaganda effort or counter propaganda effort. But still, what you see is uh, Europe has a, a difficult, uh, has set itself a difficult agenda. Uh, they use modern art. They don't want to go monumental in the 19th century. In fact, they recoiled from all that. Uh, they didn't want to, you know, call up enemy figures or hate figures to say, we hate the Chinese, we hate the Americans, we are Europe, yay, make Europe great again. This is not what Europe tried to do. So you are then limited in the, in the, in the rhetoric and the repertoire of easy, feel-good consumers. And academic art of the 19th century is more like eye candy. It's more like Walt Disney or, you know, tourists, you know, ah, <laughs> we all deep down like kitsch, you know, it, uh, it, it's sometimes nice to escape from our good taste. Um, so I think, you know, um, uh, good art, creative art will always challenge people. And uh, in the heel of the hunt, uh, this will endure and it'll create its own canon. Besides that, I think um, there should also be more space for entertainment that does not simplify the story of we were the good guys and the invaders were the bad guys. It sh shows how everybody is entangled, how many, many people have families, friends, experiences in different parts of the world, and that it, the, the compartmentalization of cultures and people is not natu na naturally by nation. Mm. So resisting the temptation to identify an other and move the move the narrative into some a completely different space. Yeah, and 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 in a way, uh, stop thinking in terms of we hate the others and that makes us heroes. This is they, there ought to be a counter narrative to that. You yeah. could think of it would might be very, it might be great fun to try and think of a European Downton Abbey instead of an, a Downton Abbey that celebrates <laughs> Englishness. That would be. In yeah. Very popular, I think. Um, yeah. I don't know how much in the UK it would be. And <laughs> we'll um, I wanted sort of to talk about the the shift. Um, it was very interesting to see you describe the shift um, from the monuments of the past um, and then becoming sites of of mourning. How um, conscious was that shift, or was that just a sort of inevitable um, oh. of the tide of of the conflicts of the twentieth century? It was inevitable, and there are many studies about this. Of course, the First World War was was an incredible trauma, and and so and then that was topped by the by the disasters of the mid century. 
So people couldn't be blithe and comfortable and, and go in for the hooray celebrations that they had until 1912, 1913. That was just not, not a viable response anymore. Um, what you do see nowadays uh, is um, that in, uh, you know, certain post-totalitarian countries, people are reverting to the 19th century style monument because they, uh, you know, they want to have uh, something more positive than those very stark uh, and trauma-driven sites of mourning that there were throughout the mid-centuries. People want to celebrate stuff again. Mm -hmm. And what do we make, therefore, of our current relationship with these statues? Because it feels extremely complex at the moment. Um, oh. We've um, moved from this sort of world in which we passively pass by these symbols of, of, the, um, of the past um, perhaps that noticing them into something that's a little bit more um, conflicted, but it's not necessarily directly tied to nationalism per se. So I'm wondering where we move from here or, or how we kind of understand our current relationship with these monuments. Yeah, um, to some extent, <clears throat> um, well, to, one complicating factor is that uh, our relationship with the past is at the moment shot through with the, the huge problem, uh, not a problem, but the huge complicating factor of the Black Lives Matter thing. So uh, people are tearing down statues left, right and center. And, and, you know, people are seeing the guilt that is in this self-celebration. Uh, and it started in the southern states in America. So we had, of course, already when all the Stalin and Lenin statues were pulled down in Central Europe and the Saddam Hussein statue was pulled down in Baghdad. Uh, but that this is now also affecting those 19th century things. Uh, and, and those debates will go on for a little longer, I think. Um, I should hope that at some point uh, we'll be able to, um, uh, to gain a sort of a vantage ground. There's a very interesting uh, you know, display in Budapest where the monuments of the communist era are sort of put together in a type of zoo in the outskirts. Uh, and, and you, you go there and say, wow, this is how the communists did it when they were in power. And in, in a way, you don't, you see the, you know, the, the, the political hatefulness of, of the totalitarian system, but you can look at it as a museum display and it somehow lost its virulence because you are now looking at it instead of being them looking at you. So maybe we can, we can win through in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why, why do you think it's important to consider all these symbols in a historical context? How can it help us understand our mm. current moment or yeah. maybe present? Well, that really brings me to the core of my point. Uh, the fact is, these things are historical and nations always like to, to, to present themselves as being eternal. And the historian has one huge core business is to prove this is not eternal. Nations are not anthropology. The fact that I have ears on either side of my head is a given. The fact that I'm Dutch, well, that means something very different now from what it would have meant in the 19th century. So the variables of how things change and how nationalities are in a way manifestations of certain ideas at a certain moment in time and how it used to be different and can become different again. That is what the historians have to do to, to fight against anachronism. Mm. I think that's a, it's such a perfect moment to think like that, given that we're living in a in a time that is completely changing everything that we understand about our world and trying to work out whether or not that's going to be permanent or um, if we're going to go backwards. Um, how do you think the pandemic is shaping these themes? Um, the pandemic is in itself a natural phenomenon. It's not a cultural phenomenon. It's just viruses. And there's very little cultural about viruses. Uh, how we respond to that? Uh, well, very often we respond to crises by invoking old certainties to fall back on things that support it. So you see that, uh, you know, the rhetoric of a lot of heads of state is we can do this because we as English or Dutch or Germans have always you know, faced the crises in our past and we can marshal our national identity. And, you know, that is, um, it, it's a way of encouraging people and, and you know, it, it will therefore uh, tend to mm, uh, contribute to the uncertainties of the present day and age and increase the need for us to fall back on the comforting narratives of the past. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, I, and, and 
Yeah, there is the danger, of course, of vaccine nationalism of people, you know, going into fierce competition, who is going to get vaccinated first. Uh, so, um, in times of crises, you see that the nation is a sort of a, a pacifier or a bit of comfort food. And in the short run, the nation will profit from the virus. But I think that's fairly short lived. Mm. That's interesting. I, I, in, in terms of vaccine nationalism, it, it's sort of as though the nation is a simple answer to a question that we struggle to um, grapple with. So, there's, you know, just because, say, a vaccine is developed in the UK, it doesn't necessarily follow that the people of the UK should be the first ones to get it. But it's such a such a terrifying question to answer who should be the first people to get this vaccine that we would fall back on, oh, well, it was made in the UK, so let it be the UK or, or yeah. any other person that wants to come first. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I can only yeah. hope that at that point, uh, sanity and, and the spirit of, of cooperation prevails um, among the, the politicians and the head of, heads of state. Uh, you know, it's just... If everybody goes, if everybody stays as foolish as it might be, we get war. But let's hope that we get more sense. Great, thanks. Just before we hand over to questions, I just want to ask just one sort of final question. Do you feel as though um, nationalism can exist happily alongside something like the European project or, or more international yeah. um, thinking, or is it necessarily an antagonistic relationship? Mm. Yeah, good point. Um, I think nationalism, and I stress the ism in nationalism, is incompatible with the European project. Nationalism is by definition the defense of the nation against alternative modes of state organization. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, the, the two are incompatible. You can't be transnational and nationalistic at the same time. However, it should be possible to have a perfectly happy reconciliation between a sense of nationality national identities and being part of a European project. There's, there's no, no contradiction there. Um, people carry multiple shells and layers of identity around them. They can be familial, local, regional, your gender, your age group, and there is your nationality. Um, and none of these need to be incompatible. Um, I find it perfectly possible to be beholden to my hometown, to my country, Holland, and to Europe all at the same time. Uh, so it, it's when the, when the ism comes in, when you when you begin to, you know, instrumentalize your identity as the cornerstone of a political doctrine, that's when we have a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. No, thanks. I'm going to switch over to. Um, I have so many questions here from the audience, and I better get into them, otherwise I'm not going to be able to get through them. Um, so the first one um, from Lizanne uh, makes me think of something that I often think about when when you and I are talking. Um, I often sort of think, well, how do I know when I'm watching a secretly nationalist TV program? Um, and so her question is, um, I have a question about what you call the post Rambo era. Does it include things like James Bond or I think actually quite interestingly, uh, an example here is Black Swan. Ha. Huh. Um, right. Well, I mean, uh, you're, this is a dangerous question. Before you know it, I'm going to talk, you know, for hours about my current research because it's really fascinating and I have to keep this tight. So the question opens up enormous uh, things. L let me try and be brief about this. Uh, first, um, academics themselves um, to see, see things um, that might be too vague to, uh, that, and that might escape notice in, in general cultural communication. So you have to, I hate to call it woke, but you have to be alert to stereotypes. You have to see the patterns um, and you have to see, uh, you, be, you have to have some sense of the analysis of a text to see what's actually going on in there. That's why we need people who are trained in the humanities to do this. We can't just leave it to sociologists, I'm afraid. You need to have some expertise in analyzing texts and, and, and culture. Uh, secondly, um, in popular culture, not everything is national, but what you do see in James Bond is that it continues the war propaganda that started in 1914-1918 with novels like John Buchan or Hitchcock's The 39 Steps and all invasion novels and transposes this into the Cold War era. And a lot of Cold War movies were indeed following the old mode of war propaganda, for, but for leisure entertainment. And Russia was something like a Mordor where the KGB was, and then you had the heroic people in the West. 
So there is a, a we versus they, but it's not necessarily national. Um, there's a certain sense of patriotic Englishness involved that James Bond is also very British or Scottish. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, his heroism consists in facing, uh, you know, anyway, uh, Black Swan is recycling. And, and this is, in, is a form of recycling uh, a 19th century repertoire. In this case, uh, you know, the Swan Lake and, 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 and Tchaikovsky's music and the whole sort of stuff. And it's transposing it to um, a, a sort of postmodern feminist deconstructed way of, of, of you know, a more dark uh, way of looking at things. Uh, and these processes of recycling are fantastically interesting, but they're not in every case national. And I would say Black Swan is, is not really, I wouldn't really focus on that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got something here on nationalism as part of consumer culture, which you were, were talking about a little bit. Um, to what extent can um, your research on past nationalist movements help us explain modern the way modern populist movements um, deploy a strategy of selling their ideas to voters as though they were consumers? Um, well, I hope I can make a contribution there. I think that is one of the reasons why I'm doing it. Populism is one of the uh, most striking political developments of the last 20 years. Um, and most people analyze it in terms of where does the disaffection come from uh, that draws people towards populist leaders and populist discourse. So they, they, they seek social explanations. What I'm trying to look at is understand it in terms of the cultural repertoire that it holds out, the cultural comfort food. And so I, I think that will complement our understanding of populism. Um, and, and it follows slightly in the wake of M Michael Billig, who talked about banal nationalism, said, you know, it, it was big in the 19th century and then it just became a flag on a pizza box in the 20th century, but it can go hot again. And this is what I'm looking at, how culture com becomes consumer culture and from there starts being a real feeding ground for people who might, might not go to museums or might not be highly educated, but they watch DVDs in their spare time. That follows neatly into the next question, which is, um, do you think there's a, a lack of um, an absence of national heroes in, in Europe these days? And, and do we maybe not need them anymore? Um, I think there are lots and lots of heroes in Europe in, in the past and in the present. And in fact, I would say that a lot of people who are celebrated in different countries uh, for their heroism could also be celebrated by Europe at large. I think Joan of Arc um, and Pushkin are European figures and uh, as were Goethe and Schiller. So why just claim them for one particular country? And as we saw, many of these people were transnational themselves. Europe has been afraid of doing hero worship. The 19th century was big on that. And hero worship led to the cult of charismatic leaders and it became a very problematic thing. So what Bob Dylan says, don't follow leaders. It's a sort of anti-authoritarianism of the 20th century. But we can still take inspiration from great Europeans, like for me, the greatest is Dutch and European. It's Erasmus and his message of tolerance. Okay, thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a short, sharp question here saying, is uh, this kind of chauvinism, are you sure it's so unconscious? Ah. I wish I Pose refers to uh, sort of some of the more um, vocal nationalist movements that are yeah. uh, coming across in Europe at the moment. Uh, a, a lot of this, um, a lot of this chauvinism is strident and very conscious and deliberately political. And uh, you know, uh, we see on the sliding scale of ideologies, um, you know, a, a drift also towards real activism. Uh, and, and, and even neo-fascism in certain quarters. Um, but I didn't want to fall into the usual trap of people, you know, talking about populism and chauvinism and patriotism, as, as it also can feel, saying, oh, watch out, this will lead to Auschwitz. You know, we've seen this before, the jackboots are stamping the streets again. I think that's a little reductive. It is there and it is definitely a presence and it has a certain attractive force. But there are lots of lots of people who just buy into it without necessarily being anti-democratically minded, but just because it's good fun. So I wanted to put that on the agenda as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, we're sort of channeling a certain need um, without it necessarily translating into something particularly damaging. Sorry, I, I, I got a pop up on my screen there, Laura. Could you repeat that, please? 
So I was just uh, following on from that, just suggesting that perhaps we're channeling channeling certain needs that we've learned to um, learn to uh, express ourselves in this way over time, and channeling that need without it turning necessarily into something damaging. Yes. Um, see, this is it, it's the dual face of nationalism. Um, partly, uh, the nation is a comfort zone, and it is also a zone of solidarity. Um, and um, people uh, enjoy uh, the community, the fellow feeling of uh, you know a society that they're beholden to, um, and uh, that is a, a natural form of loyalty. But uh, there is the, the downside of that is that this in-group is always contrasted against some sort of out-group. Now, you know, there are big theories about this. I won't go into the finesses of ethnic and civic nationalism and all that. But um, uh, the danger is always that those people who try to mobilize people through the force of fellow feeling and solidarity and loyalty do so with a definite othering or, uh, of, of, of setting the group off against, you know, outsiders who are considered threatening, dangerous, or otherwise disturbing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so here we have a question. I think it's quite interesting and it's in how specific it is. It says, I would want to ask about the connections between the 19th century nationalism and modern populism at the European and global level. I think that's quite interesting because I think often we have a tendency to make comparisons with the 20th century. When we're mm. talking about the populists of today, but what about the 19th century? What's going on with that? Um, the 19th century, uh, I, th I think well, what I tried to show in my talk was that there is a bit of a pendulum movement. So we have nationalism na and the 20th century and now again. Uh, to some extent, there are great continuities. Uh, uh, in another sense, uh, there is a great difference. Nationalism in the 19th century was moving against uh, the a political landscape that was uh, ruled by absolute monarchs and emper emperors and where, uh, you know, cultural communities were divided over many principalities or else multi-ethnic empires kept a lot of different uh, cultures under the rule of a central government. So there was a certain uh, reformist message in 19th century nationalism, the idea of challenging the power of the state. At the present, uh, nationalism is usually directed against international cooperation, no longer at multi-ethnic empires. Nationalists like to present Europe as a continuation of Charlemagne and Hitler, but it isn't. It was based against Hitler. So people are now, in being nationalistic, doing something very much different from 19th century nationalism, trying to go unilateralist trying to be exceptionalists, trying to have their own country do different things from all other countries and forget about international cooperation. So the, the ongoing factor is that um, uh, 19th century nationalism and contemporary nationalism both believe that the nation should do its own thing. But in the 19th century, this was against powerful empires. And in the 21st century, this is against international cooperation. In fact, on that note, we have another question which uh, asks whether or not there's actually um, potentially a bit of an international pattern to nationalism. Um, the example used here is the movie Braveheart, which the questioner says um, has been adopted as a symbol in Italy by the Lega Nord um, in the 1990s. So is there actually a kind of inter internationalization of nationalism? That makes me think of the images of the films you saw you showed us um, with such similar imagery across all different um, nations, films that I've never seen from Asia, um, but they are immediately uh, familiar to us in terms of the, the, the um, visual language of their speaking. Yes, absolutely. Um, my, my great example and, 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 and uh, admired colleague Anne-Marie Thiès uh, in, in Paris coined the beautiful phrase, there is nothing more international than nationalism. <laughs> uh, the, the idea that, you know, it, it's everybody thinks they're special and nobody realizes that there's nothing special in thinking that you're special because everybody thinks they're special. So, uh, you know, um, and it, it also means that indeed that nationalist gestures can very easily travel from one community to another or one, from one society to another. Uh, it is well known how uh, certain Italian operas 
areas celebrating the liberty of, of this or that community um, were taken up in Belgium or all around Europe and saying this is about us. And I can imagine Lega Nord saying Braveheart is about us. So uh, th that ramification is absolutely going on. Yes, good point. That also makes me think of something that you've mentioned to me before about how we tend to um, view the nationalism of other nations as being something quite different to the nationalism of our own um, country and our own behaviours. Yeah, um, yeah, th there is that, of course. Um, we, we tend to notice uh, how uh, strongly national identities are asserted abroad. So when we go to a foreign city, we say, wow, there's really lots of statues here. Why is that? Be well, there's just as many statues in our own hometowns, except we stop seeing them. They've become banal. They've become like, you know, bus stops or, or lampposts. They're just part of the street furniture. And if you go to a different city, you're, you're immediately aware of it. Um, so many people have a tendency to say it's the others who are nationalists, not us. Uh, Terry Eagleton used the beautiful phrase that nationalism is like bad breath. You only notice it in other people. Uh, and that's because, it, you know, it's more salient. It, it's, it's something that that's, strikes you, whereas your own nationalism is ambient. It's banal, as Michael Billick might call it. Um, so uh, people tend to underestimate the nationalism in their own country, unless, of course, it's really problematic there. But uh, there tends to be, uh, you know, a, a habituation to your own nationalism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a question here about... Um, how is it possible to move away from the archaic, archaic idea of nation states in a capitalist framework? Um, the speaker says that they think it's necessary to transcend national identities to address planetary concerns and that a global um, approach is needed, I, I presume, to something like climate change. Um, mm. And our cultures and national identities need to be reappraised as part of a new vision. Mm. Um, where do you see us heading in that sense, these grand yeah. global problems? Well, yeah, okay. Um, you should never ask historians to predict the future. Uh, <laughs> but um, the point is is a very good one. Um, um, let me let me phrase it inside out. Uh, there used to be a school of thought, and one still encounters this, that says uh, the nation state is the is is the best product in town. There is no better alternative than it. Uh, you know, we have seen lots of different ways of trying to organize the state and, you know, the nation state is still, of all the ones, the best that we can have. Um, I tend to be a little skeptical about that. Um, if you see how in 1918, 1919, a lot of uh, countries in Europe gained their independence following the First World War. And now we tend to say, well, it was all smashed by Hitler and Stalin. No, it wasn't smashed by Hitler and Stalin. Most of these countries abandoned their own democracy before Hitler and Stalin showed up, from Metaxas in Greece to Horty, Horty in, in, in Hungary to uh, Pilsudski in Poland to Franco, Mussolini, Salazar in Portugal. Every country that was based on an agenda of national independence eventually you know, sacrificed democracy to strong nationality. So I think the, the nation state as the the person who asked the question seems to imply might be a 19th century ideal that can bear rethinking and rethinking critically. Now, I'm not quite sure what to put in its place. I think certainly transnational governance needs to be strengthened. The great problems of the present day and age, migrant streams, climate change, viruses, rising sea levels, um, all these are international, transnational problems, and we cannot face them by every state trying to do its own thing. So international cooperation will have to be strengthened one way or the other. Personally, I sometimes should, would wish for a separation between state and culture. We now have, in most countries, not in Britain, but in most countries, we have a separation between church and state. Uh, people can uh, do their religion in whatever way they like, and religion is a very fundamental identity for a lot of people. And the state says, that's your business. We don't have anything to do with that. We're all about taxes and how to spend your money, your tax money on public projects. Um, I think uh, a state that withdraws from culture, 
and no longer says we embody the nation and we, the state, shall make sure that the nation survives, uh, will also be a state that is readier to enter into international co cooperation and into networks uh, in order to confront the great problems of the day and age. So I, I, I agree that the nation state might, uh, you know, could do with a little bit of critical rethinking. Okay. And um, you mentioned religion there, and we actually have a question here about how religion p maps onto this uh, discourse that you've been discussing. Um, I suppose we could we could go back to the historical side of, <laughs> of the discussion, but you're more happy um, to talk. To, could you just give us a little bit of an overview about where religion has fitted in into these this imagery in the 19th century and 20th century, and maybe a little bit more now? It's it's massively complex. Um, we would have to need we would need another hour for that at least. But that, that, left, so. yeah, no. <laughs> that's the title of the talk, right? I, I knew what I let myself in for here. Um, religion is older than the state and older than the nation. Uh, it, it's a very deep uh, and and for people who are believers, a very fundamental point of loyalty and identification. And the state has great problems competing with religion for the loyalty of uh, the population. Um, in many respects, the state has tried to imitate religions. Uh, we, we call that secular religion and, and tries to position itself as sacral. So we go through almost religious liturgies when we, you know, uh, uncover our heads uh, when we hear the national anthem. And it's almost as if we're in a religious service and we feel that awe about something transcendent. Uh, so, and that is basically the state trying to buy into the power of religion. In other cases, um, you know, states have to compete with religion for the loyalty. And you see that in, in uh, religiously divided communities, such as uh, former Yugoslavia uh, or Northern Ireland, uh, where huge, big uh, intercommunal uh, violence can, can take place. And we're not quite sure to which extent this is motivated by competing ethnicities or uh, national identities or religions. It's very murky. And at present, of course, um, Islam is used as a, you know, a proxy term to basically, you know, be racist and say, I don't like people coming from outside Europe. But because you're not allowed to say that, so you say Islam is like fascism and, and you know, and that sort of groups Arabs and Turks and, and Moroccans and all the rest of them together. Uh, so, I, uh, at present, it's just a pretext for old-fashioned nationalism, but there are very, very deep, complex relationships between religious identity and state identity. And I think it was a wise choice um, for Europe uh, to actually, you know, in, 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 institute a separation between church and state, keep them separate. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to just ask uh, what what you feel that we, uh, as we, as uh, your audience goes back out into our, well, if anyone's going outside anymore, um, I'm not. Uh, it, it, when we come across these symbols of, of what could be described as banal nationalism, what should we be thinking? What should I, when I pick up a postage stamp or when I, when I pick up a £10 note and I see a nationalist yeah. symbol on it, how should I absorb that? Um, should I contemplate it a bit more um, than I generally do? Or should I just carry on just blithely throwing around these simple <laughs> nationalists? <laughs> um, yeah, um, well, you, I, it wouldn't help to be irritated by it all the time. You just mm -hmm. become one of those real, you know, boring grouches who are saying, you know, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be. Uh, at the same time, uh, you shouldn't take it for granted. You should see through it. So it's like watching an ad for a commercial product. Uh, they work with hidden persuaders. Much of it works, you know, not through your frontal cortex, not through your rational brain, but somehow through your, your, your Pavlovian reflexes, et cetera. And it's always good to see these things for what they are. And when you see a statue for some hero, to also think, when was the statue put up? By whom? For what reason? Uh, so, in, in, in otherwise, to, to have an informed, rational look at it and understand it better rather than just being the victim of, of the propaganda. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, who do you think are the lists of today? Who are the, what role do intellectuals play now? Um, or is it, or is it the intellectuals that are making all these movies that we're watching? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, uh, I think there is at the moment a fantastic cohort of, of um, people who are really working towards a, uh, a, a greater European culture. And these are the filmmakers. Um, to, to group them together as European art house movies, for want of a better term. Uh, that is really helping the various audiences in the various cities of Europe and of the world to understand what it was like for the others. That's Leben der Anderen, to really see the complexities. And, you know, I think European culture is thriving uh, because of cultural creativity. And that is ongoing. Artists still have that thing. And good artists tend to, you know, be more empathetic and less melodramatic and less simplistic. And I think a lot of that is being produced. If you look at the, uh, you know, the, the great uh spreaders of nationalist messages i think they are equally strong um and i'm at this moment trying to map them and to see uh, what's going on particularly in in the post ussr states of of the former ussr is very worrying in terms of nationalist propaganda also in turkey uh mm -hmm. under erdogan turkish television series have taken on a really really rank uh, ethno nationalist propagandistic term. So we shouldn't be afraid of identif identifying that either. Television, uh, streaming services, they tend to be the platforms of the new nationalism. Well, I think that's a really good place to uh, to wrap up. Um, I was going to ask if you had any recommendations for what we should all be watching in our, in our confinement, um, perhaps not something from uh, the nationalist propaganda of Russia or Turkey, but are there any uh, European films that we should be watching in our lockdown state? Um, I um, I just mentioned Das Leben der Anderen, okay. uh, and there are very good documentaries around. I, I, you, you caught me out here. Um, I I, you're the the last desert, desert Island Discs. Uh, um, so, um, no, I, I'll pass on that one. I, okay, I can think fair of enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, I think we actually have to now have to wrap up anyway. Um, that's it's been such a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Professor Lisson. Um, thank you all also for all of your questions. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of them, but you ha had absolutely really great ideas. Um, and perhaps you want to reach out on Twitter to talk about them a bit more. Um, but with that, um, we'll wrap up this session hosted by Alia. Thank you very much, Alia, for organising this. Um, I'm glad that we could get it together, even though we couldn't all be together in person. Um, and thank you very much, Professor Lisson. Thank you for having me. Thank you.